Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this first talk of mine. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, embedded async with a focus on embassy. Um, there's going to be a lot of code. Um, I wanted to say, please sit close. Uh, it, it might be a little hard to read from the from the back. There, there are some seats left. Uh, if you can read the bottom line, you should be all right. <laughs> uh, that, that's the smallest it will get, the smallest. So who am I? Who am I? Uh, well, uh, Dirk Jan already uh, introduced me a bit. Uh, I've been doing embedded Rust since 2019, um, and uh, I've, I've become a fan uh, of async embedded Rust uh, since then. You can follow me on Twitter or, or on Mastodon. Uh, but yeah, here we go. So here's my agenda for today. Um, first off, we need to know what async actually really is. Uh, and there are actually multiple ways of, of doing it. Uh, so we're gonna look at polling, add some interrupts, and then we're gonna see how uh, async Rust works with futures and wakers. Uh, we'll, uh, in the end, we're gonna look at the real embassy code uh, that, that's come from uh, the master branch of like yesterday. Um, so yeah, hopefully you will all be able to follow along. So what is asynchronous coding? Well, basically you want to do multiple things at the same time. And ideally uh, you would do them in actually at the same time. Uh, most PCs do that. Uh, everybody's mobile phones do that. Uh, because you've got multiple cores and those cores can do things in parallel <laughs> uh, which you can find at the top uh, but sometimes you, do, you need to do more work per thread or you only have one core one thread so you will need to uh, time share your tasks so basically you're going to start switching between your two tasks or more tasks um, so yeah, on, on embedded, we usually have only one core or every core uh, may work uh, independent. Uh, so uh, a con concurrent uh, uh, asynchronous coding is what usually happens. So we are going uh, to only look at that. So how can you switch between tasks? Um, well, we're gonna look at two examples. First off, you can uh, uh, do a polling loop. Well, this only loops, uh, uh, this only pulls one thing. Uh, basically, uh, this is the example I'm, I'm gonna use. We have a button, we have an LED. When the button is pressed, we want the LED to be on. Well, pretty simple. We just have a loop, we read the button state and then update the LED with the button state. Pretty easy, but not very efficient because this will spin you on, on your CPU for 100% of the time. And if you cr uh, create a battery operated uh, uh, embedded device, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not great. You want to sleep. You, you, you don't want to spend all these cycles. Uh, polling is also not nice if you start to do more things. Um, the code here isn't, isn't important, but, but this uh, blinks an LED here at the top and pulls a radio and we need to create our own state machines and we need to care about uh, what happens when one poll uh, takes a long time like say say we need to we need to transfer uh, a kilobyte of data over a slow spy bus to the radio well it, it could be that that our blink suddenly is is delayed a lot uh, this is the smallest code <laughs> it, it will become <laughs> Um, so a way to increase uh, in increase efficiency is by using interrupts. Um, with interrupts, we can just set up the button to um, um, well give an interrupt and, and interrupt our norm normal flow of the, of the program. So interrupts are a way to do the uh, um, uh, concurrency automatically. Uh, this is very efficient because our uh, CPU can just go to sleep when nothing is going on. But it, re it requires a lot of setup. We need to manage the interrupt. Uh, we need to share the data to the interrupt. Um, so it all adds up to quite a bit. Now, luckily for this, uh, a wonderful library called Arctic exists. 
so if you if you're gonna use interrupts a lot, just use Arctic. Uh, it's not gonna get better than that. Um, then we've got async rust. And instead of like the pseudo code I, I gave, this is like actual embassy code that, that you can write. We've got a main function, um, uh, which uh, before that, you, you can't see that because there is a, a recording bar there, but uh, th there's a, a macro at the top as well, um, which uh, starts the executor for us. <laughs> it's gonna get fixed maybe. Um, uh, it will start the executor for us. Uh, we, we then uh, just initialize our uh, uh, peripherals and stuff. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, we then initialize our button. Uh, we initialize our LED as an output. And then we can just write a loop. And in the loop, we just ask the button very politely to wait for any edge. We await that. The function will uh, continue after any edge has occurred, so a falling edge or a rising edge. Uh, and then we will simply read our LED uh, with the value of our button. And this loop just continues. But this, this looks kind of magical, really. Like, what, what's actually happening here? Uh, how does it work? And is it even efficient? Well, behind all of this, click. Well, the click doesn't work. Yeah. All uh, right, it clicked away. Yep. <laughs> um, behind all, all of this uh, async uh, stuff uh, are futures. <laughs> and a future is a trait, which is uh, defined uh, by uh, the Rust uh, core library. And uh, it's actually a pretty simple interface. A future has an output type, and then it only has one function called poll. And basically, to uh, uh, finish a, uh, a future, you just got to have to call poll a few times. The result type is also called poll, which should really be pull a result, I think. But uh, anyway, it's, it's an enum which can either be ready with the uh, output that is required or pending, which signals that the future is not done yet and has to be called again. Um, the function has two parameters, a self with like a pin. I'm, I'm not going get, to get into pin. Um, uh, and there's also a, a context, and the context is something that is given by the executor, uh, so you have a little bit of access to the executor. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. So basically, uh, we can make a polling loop with futures, something like this. Say we have all these different tasks. Uh, in principle, we, we can use futures to uh, pull the main task, then pull the button task, then the LED, then the radio, then the serial, then the main, and so on and so on. But that's not more efficient than the polling loop I showed in, in the beginning. Like, it's, can we make this more efficient? Can, can we use interrupts? And well, yes. You can still do this. Uh, the most simple executor uh, will, will do it this way, just, just call, call pull every time. Um, and uh, at least one uh, uh, positive thing about it is that you don't have to write your state machines yourself uh, because uh, Rust will uh, turn your async functions into state machines on its own. But uh, let's see how we can uh, add interrupts to, to this. So I've got a little, little diagram here. Um, on the left, we, we've, we've got a few tasks. On the bottom right, we've, we've got our executor. And somewhere in memory, uh, uh, we put our waker. And this is a new concept. A waker allows us to signal uh, the executor that a task should be woken up. So basically, uh, what, what the promise of, of, a, of a future is, is you, you can pull it. And uh, if it returns pending, you only have to pull it again once the waker 
has been, well, triggered. There, there is a wake function on, on the waker. So in, in this case, our interrupt on, on the right uh, knows about this waker because that's simply how that interrupt was written. So say we start our program and the executor uh, picks a task to run. It calls Paul on it. And that function keeps running until it wants to wait on something. So what the task does uh, is uh, it, it knows it, it wants to wait for a, a certain interrupt. Uh, we'll, we'll see this later in, in real embassy code, how, the, how this works. Um, but it, it knows that it has to store its waker, which it can get through the context uh, parameter from the future. Uh, it stores that in this static memory position. Uh, at some point, all the tasks are, are done. They are all waiting or all finished. Uh, and the executor goes to sleep. Uh, usually this is a, a wait for interrupt kind of sleep. After that, the interrupt fires. The interrupt does some processing uh, of, of the data, uh, sets some things up, and eventually it calls the static waker. And through the waker, uh, some sort of flag is set in the task. When the interrupt is done, uh, the execution yields back to the, uh, uh, to the executor because it was uh, sleeping until there was an interrupt. So uh, yeah, execution resumes there. And then it's actually pretty simple. The executor looks at the first task. Has it been woken up? No. Second task, woken up? No. Third task? Hey, this flag is set. We should call Paul again. It removes the flag so that next time we'll, we'll wake up. Uh, it, it won't get pulled again. And like, this is really pretty much all, all there is to it. Um, we, we use the Rust async machinery to uh, do, do the rest for us. There are some details, of course, with memory locations and pinning and all that kind of stuff. And uh, going through every task uh, every time you wake up isn't the most efficient. That's not what Embassy does. Um, but I, I, I hope this gives a good overview of uh, uh, what an executor does, really, and, and what a waker uh, is for. So let's look at the uh, Embassy code again, or, well, the code that, that uses Embassy. Uh, at, at the bottom, we've got the wait for any edge function that we call. What does it actually do? When we go looking at it, it does this. Basically, it uh, sets its own internal pin to sense for the opposite edge or, op or opposite value of what it currently is. Like if, if itself is high, then we want to sense for low and vice versa. Okay, cool. Um, in principle, this is all it takes for uh, an interrupt to fire at some point. Then a new uh, port input future is created and a reference to the pin is given and that's something we await. Okay, well, what does, what does that do? This is the future. Uh, a future is, is an object that implements the future trait. And the first thing it does is we, we, we've got this port wakers here. This is somewhere uh, defined uh, as a static variable. And we, we look at our uh, pin uh, at, the, at the port of it, and we, we register our waker on that location. And we get the waker by just calling the waker function on the context uh, that we get from the executor. So that's setting up for being woken up by, by an interrupt. Uh, but then we also need to decide whether uh, the future is ready or whether we're still waiting. Well, what Embassy does is uh, in, in the previous slide, we've uh, enabled the sense mechanism uh, and the interrupt will disable it. So if it's disabled, we know that we're done. 
So that's what this is uh, doing, this if statement. If it's disabled, we're ready uh, with, with a unit type because it doesn't return anything special, or else uh, the f this future is pending. And well, if, if we're going to look for uh, where that port wakers object is, is stored, well, there, there's all kinds of configuration. Uh, well, yeah, here it is. It's just a static variable somewhere. So say uh, this was just set up, uh, uh, the future returned pending, our executor goes to sleep. What happens now? Uh, at some point, the interrupt will fire. So a lot of code here. Uh, basically, this interrupt needs to figure out which pin has just triggered this interrupt. Um, if you're curious, this is from the GPIOTE uh, peripheral from the Nordic chips. Uh, you don't really have to know a lot about it. Basically, there are channel wakers, um, but there is also a port event. So if a port event has gone off, uh, we reset the port event, and finally we look uh, for every bit that was enabled in the port event. We uh, wake our port waker object uh, for the uh, pin that was uh, just just triggered, and we also set the uh, sense to to disabled because that's what Embassy decided to do. That's pretty much all of, uh, this interrupt is. So, um, right. So what happens in this wake function? How does it actually wake the task up? Now, every waker has a, a virtual table. So this wake uh, just calls some pointer to somewhere. Uh, in, in embassy, that ends up over here through some, some other functions, but this is the, the interesting bit. Uh, basically, it uh, uh, looks uh, or it, it searches uh, the task that is associated with the waker. Um, and finally, it, uh, yeah, it will mark it as scheduled. And in the end, it will enqueue this task on some sort of run queue. So what the embassy does is uh, they don't set a flag on every task, but they uh, uh, create a linked list with all woken tasks, and this just appends it on the linked list. Uh, after this, the, the interrupt is done. We uh, yield back to the, uh, uh, to the executor. Uh, turns out the executor was just this. Uh, we have a wait for event instruction and it will just pull and then wait for the event again. Um, I decided not to show you exactly what pull does uh, because there is a lot of task and linked list management that's not very interesting. Uh, but eventually we will end up in this port input future again. We've already seen this slide, but now we re-register the waker. Seems like you shouldn't have to do that, but it doesn't really matter in, in, in the end because you can, uh, if, if a waker gets woken when it doesn't have to, it turns out it's not a real, real problem. But the interrupt, the interrupt has gone off and our uh, sense has been disabled, so we know we are ready. Uh, this future now returns. Uh, there's nothing after it, so this async function returns, and we get back to our original code, and we get on to the LED, which, well, sets its own level, and then we do everything all over again. Uh, I hope this was, this was kind of clear. Uh, it's, it's a lot, um, but uh, basically that's what I have to tell you. <laughs> Are we going to do questions? Yes. Or? yes, we have time for questions. So if anyone has a questions? Yes. Um, if you could uh, call the people in the front, oh. that would be great. Could you come here and ask your question? Would you like to ask a question? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm going to talk to him because it's last year. Uh, like I was mainly wondering because I've come across Embassy before when I was searching uh, for like some framework to use. Uh, with embedded Rust, but I, I couldn't get a clear answer for what is the performance set and what is the effect on the, the binary size, because it looks like a quite a big system, actually. Uh, it's actually funny you mentioned that. Uh, I've, I've written a blog post like a year ago where I compare uh, Embassy to uh, FreeRTOS, uh, which is not exactly apples to apples, but it's not apples to, to cars or anything. It's, <laughs> they are similar. Um, and I uh, thought like embassy would lose on on like all the hard numbers. Uh, in the end, like embassy is faster, it's smaller, it, it, it's nicer to use than 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 free articles. So yeah, it, it's 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 heavier than say uh, like surely bare metal code, uh, and it's also heavier than than like Arctic. Uh, so if you want to to get the the last ounce of performance out of your chip maybe don't use embassy uh but in in, in practice like it, it, it's really fast uh, yeah <laughs> uh just try it out I, I would say uh see if it's if it's good enough it, it probably is there was some other question over there <laughs> I didn't know I had to come to the front. <laughs> anyway, stage fright. <laughs> yeah, stage fright. So, um, if I'm doing it, you guys can do it too. Um, I had a question about, I think, two slides back. Um, yeah, here. You, uh, no, it was just one more, I believe. In, in the pool of, yeah, port input future. Here you say that the uh, a re-registering of the uh, uh, future with the waker uh, wasn't going to be any problem, but what would be against um, doing this only in the else uh, class of this if condition here? Uh, nothing. I, I saw that that too when I looked at this code. Like it, it could be put in the else and it would work just as well. Okay. <laughs> so, if anybody wants to make a PR to Embassy, well, here's, here's your chance. <laughs> Break up my laptop. Basically, uh, um, why re-registering the waker uh, isn't that bad is because if the task gets woken up like an, an extra time by accident, like all, all you've spent is like couple of cycles of CPU time. That, that, that's it. Um, so in this uh, example, we only wait on a single let uh, or a single pin to go low, and then we put the bet high. Let's say I had uh, more than one event that I wanted to wait for. I don't know which one's going to trigger first. Mm -hmm. uh, how would I uh, use Embassy for that? So in Embassy, you can uh, define multiple tasks that can run uh, well, yeah, con concurrently. Uh, so you can write them as if they were uh, each their, their own like threat thing. Uh, if for some reason you don't want to have another task, uh, there's a whole, whole suite of um, uh, futures uh, extension functions. So there's something called a select. Uh, you can give it multiple futures. And when the first one uh, of those completes, it, it will return the result of that one. You can put that, that in a loop so you can select on which one uh, 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 yeah, uh, finishes. But there's also a join function, which waits on all of them. Uh, so yeah, you, you've got lots of options. Okay, thank you. Hey Dion, Hi. thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you're writing a system where you have strict deadline constraints on your tasks, mm -hmm. does Ember Embassy provide any infrastructure to do that? Yes, well, sort of. Um, so uh, in async, uh, uh, everything works cooper cooperatively. So if one task or one 
future thing uh, t takes a long time, L like uh, the rest of the, uh, like, if you use something like free artos, uh, you've got multiple threats that can preempt each other. They can interrupt each other. Uh, that's not what how it works in uh, async Rust. What you can do, however, with, with Embassy is run not one executor, but two executors. Um, one of the executors you can run in, a, in an interrupt context. So it will have higher priority than your main executor. So you can put your one little special deadline task on the other executor. And uh, whenever uh, um, uh, that, that one has to uh, say an interrupt happens and it's, uh, uh, it, it wakes up the, the executor, the interrupt executor will, will always go first. So uh, I don't know if it's good enough to like have actual super hard deadlines, but you can make it a, a whole a whole lot more real time this way. Uh, there, there are some examples in the embassy uh, repo. Have you tried? I haven't tried it, uh, but I have seen it work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. I think that was the last question. If you have other questions for Dion, please find him in the break or after. Thanks, Dion, for your talk. That's great.